Blog Talk Radio. Good morning, good morning uh, out there, all of our Blog Talk Radio off the shelf book listeners and all the book lovers and writers. And of course, we've had people on our show like Monday. I have to tell you guys, we have a, a change. Monday at 7 p.m., please set your calendars. We have an author who's going to discuss mental illness. And again, that's this Monday, November the 14th at 7 p.m. I'm going to say it one more time. Please write it down on your calendar, Monday, November the 14th at 7 p.m. Please come back here to Off the Shelf. This is a topic that impacts probably every, well, I won't even say probably, every community. There's not a community or, or, or workspace that's not impacted by this. We get embarrassed and ashamed and people suffer in silence. So I encourage you to come back again tomorrow, I mean Monday, 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 November the 14th at 7 p.m. You don't want to miss it. You might learn something that could help either you or it could help save your own child's life. So, again, I encourage you to tune in Monday. And then we'll be back next Saturday as well. But uh, I'm right now focusing on today and Monday. So your list, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, we are 12 years in at Off the Shelf. And every time I say that, it shocks me. We've been doing this for 12 years. Uh, But for those of you who have been, you might be joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you and our loyal listeners who we absolutely adore here at Off the Shelf. Welcome to our Saturday, November the 12th show. And thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. We have a wonderful author, a talented author. She also may provide some insights on marketing because that's another specialty of hers. But she's on deck for today's Off the Shelf, and we're excited to introduce her to you. But before we do that, I want to drop a word in, in your thoughts, something for you to think about as you go through your day and the week. And and today's message is don't limit your challenges. Challenge your limits. We have to live a courageous life. We When we get we become afraid, we think other people can dominate us or control us, we don't have any We've lost our voice, and that's not true. That's not true if you have courage. That's not true if you have courage and we act, take action with love. Now, to our off-the-shelf listeners, I want to ask you, how good a mystery sleuth are you? Are you one of those people who likes to watch mystery shows and read books and figure it out? Who did it before it happened? I grew up when those shows came on television, and I would always try to figure out, was it the butler, was it this before they told you who it was. Well, if you if you like that, you're a mystery sleuth, and if you also value relationships, romantic relationships and re- non-romantic relationships, relationships between friends and between a parent and a child, I think you're truly going to love, love pour over me. I really do. It has all those key elements in it. Now, when you read Love, Pour Over Me, you're going to see how the characters start out in the book. They're, they're, they're going to go through a lot of very intense situations. You will also see how they help to shape and mold each other. And at the end of the book, you will see how each of them has changed. And, and it won't be like a dramatic, unbelievable shift. You'll see over time. And you probably, when you read the book, will see how you impact other people, and you might decide to change some things you say, your behavior, what you think about other people, how you feel about other people, because our thoughts are powerful, so that you can have a a positive love pour over me experience in your own personal life. And you can get love pour over me in print or ebook. You can get it through Ebook It, Barnes and Barnes and Noble, Amazon, Walmart. It's on. Uh, it's available. It, it was in Google Books. You wherever books are sold, you can get a copy of Love for Over Me. If you don't see it on the shelves, just all you gotta do is ask the clerk. I want to order a copy of Love Pour Over Me by Denise Turney, and they can get you a copy because it's carried by the largest book distributors in the world. So please go out and get yourself a copy just in time for the holidays as well, and let me know how you enjoy Love Pour Over Me. And now let us go and meet today's special off-the-shelf guest. 
And our special guest today is Paulette Harper. She has been on Off the Shelf before, and we're delighted to have her back here with us this morning. Paulette is a mother. She's a grandmom, a mentor, a book marketer, a workshop leader, and a Bible student and teacher. Wow, she's got a full plate. And Paulette is also the author of the books Completely Whole, That Was Then, This Is Now, Living Separate Lives, Princess Navia, which is a children's book, and right now, Arthur's Manual, and Paulette's new book is titled Secret Places Revealed, and we're going to focus on that. But we may touch on our other books as well this morning. And you can check Paulette out online at www.pauletteharper.com, and it's P-A-U-L-E-T-T-E-H-A-R-P-E-R.com. Again, that's P A U L E T T E. H A R P E R dot com. Paulette Harper dot com. In fact, since we're on the internet, you can go over to our website, Paulette Harper dot com, check out her books, her bio, and learn more about her, even while you listen to today's show. Welcome to Off the Shelf, Paulette. Hello, Denise. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be on with you again today. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been and it's it's and when I heard you had a new book coming out, I was like, Whoa, she is one dynamo. She just keeps <laughs> keeps going because I know you also help other authors and support other writers through your marketing efforts. Now, for those this is a question I ask all of our guests and not everybody who's tuning in catch today's show has heard your previous shows, but for our listeners, if you want to hear Paula's previous shows, you can check them out in the archives. Um but for those who didn't catch any, any of your previous interviews, can you tell us where you grew up, Paulette, and what life was like for you growing up? Sure. I grew up in a small town called Pittsburgh, California, and um, Pittsburgh, California is in the northern uh, Bay Area, um, probably about 25 minutes from the San Francisco, uh, Berkeley, Oakland area. And I grew up with um, seven siblings. I am the youngest, and life for me growing up because we there were so many of us in our in our home. Um, it was and me being the baby. Um, it was um, I grew up in a very loving home with um, three other brothers and four other sisters, and um, of course being the youngest, uh, I don't think I was spoiled, but they probably. They probably felt that I was, <laughs> being that I was the youngest. <laughs> but um, as I mentioned, um, you know, I grew up in a loving home where, um, you know, we were, you know, Sundays was always about, you know, family and dinner, and we all, you know, when we could sit at the dinner table together and and just, you know, converse and, you know, talk about, you know, just life. And, um, and that's, you know, the um, it was the, a, a family unit. Definitely was a family unit, which I uh, really um, loved at that time. And then growing up in that kind of atmosphere was was um, was something that I will always cherish. And you know what, we we sort of have come away from that. I, I, there was there has to have been something that we thought uh, was more important, whether it was money or a job, something we thought would make us feel better about ourselves. Because I, people, I don't think people sit down at the kitchen table the way they used to. And then you, we used to go over to my grandparents on on almost every Sunday you were over there. And I hear so many people say they used to do that when they grew up, and now you don't see it as much. You knew your neighbors, you knew your neighbors' kids, you knew your neighbors' grandkids. Now you don't even know your neighbors' <laughs> names. <laughs> so it's just changed. It, it has changed so much. And I think it's it, that maybe even as writers – as we revisit that in our stories, we can encourage uh, other people, younger people, to to get back to that. So, Paulette, I have to ask you: You do so much now. Your mom, your grandmom, your Bible study teacher, you 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 are a book marketer, you're a novelist. You do so many things. What did you dream of becoming when you were a kid? What was the one thing when you were a kid you said, "When I grow up, this is what I really want to be." Well, I can tell you it was none of the things that I'm doing right now. You know, um, wow. I grew up, yeah, yeah. Um, I grew up thinking that I would, you know, either be a teacher, 
uh, or just, you know, really a homemaker. And um, it really wasn't until, um, you know, I got out of high school and went to college for, um, you know, a few years that I, um, I got into um, like finance. And that's my background in accounting and accounts receivable. And I had been doing that for, and I still do it, um, I had been doing that for years. And um, then in 2008, that's when the writing started to, you know, to come into into play in my life. But really growing up, just wanting to be a teacher. And, you know, um, you know when I grew up, that was the, the, the career that, you know, I was more exposed to teaching. And, um, you know, my I had some siblings that, you know, went to college and they were working in, in business. And so I had that kind of, you know, atmosphere, you know, surrounding me as well. But just really, you know, thinking about being, a, you know, a teacher and, um, you know, as I mentioned, it wasn't until 2008 that I started writing and then, you know, everything about my life just totally changed and went in that direction. 2008? I'm surprised. Yeah. I would have thought you had been writing since the 19, 1990s <laughs> with the number of books that you that you put out, which kind of segues into my next question. Is that was then, this is now, is that your first book? Yes, it was. Yeah, that was my very first book, which was released in 2008, and it's a nonfiction uh, inspirational story. And that's really where my life took such a drastic change and um, sharing my journey of going through a divorce and and reconciliation or restoration, I should say, of my life. That really opened up um, the opportunities for me to be able to pin more books, to, to be able to speak more to an audience. And really, it opened up um, a greater door for me to be able to effectively share my life and my journey uh, what happened to me in that transformation, and um, it, you know, I, I look back, back to 2008 and see where I've come from, and we're living in 2016 now. And that's been eight years, and so a lot of ha- a lot of things have happened and transpired in my life. It's been amazing, and I'm very grateful to the Lord for it. And um, but yeah, it's um, that was very my very first book and it's still on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble, people are still buying it and talking about it and and I'm really glad that that book is really still um alive and people can still um you know grab copies of it and it's a great teachable tool uh, for anyone that's you know going through some changes in life. Yes, now the book deals with um that was then this is now does it um does it deal with like depression from a personal perspective or for from a clinical and it's odd you know I, here I am sitting here before I guess for Monday, and I'm now talking about that and this is now what you went through. It's just amazing how God links everything, but does yeah. that book deal with does it deal with depression and what does it approach it from more of a clinical research perspective or personal there are there are millions. I yeah. saw on the cover of Time magazine that more and more kids are are struggling with mental health issues and committing suicide. And we act like it, that if stuff doesn't hit the media a lot. We act like it's not happening. But there are millions of kids, teenagers, and adults dealing with this, and everybody just keeps it quiet, pretends, and suffers in silence. Does it? What? How does it take on depression? And thank you for writing that book. That was the issues now. Yeah, you know, from my own personal um, experience, I, I I came from my my own. It's my own testimony. It's my own uh, story about um, you know depression and suicide and low self esteem. And and at that particular time, um, I was it was it was really traumatic for me to be going through um, a divorce. I was in my forties, and my life was had totally changed. And so dealing with depression, I had never um, experienced it before. I had never, nobody had ever told me about it. I never, you know, knew anything about it. I learned uh, because I was going through it. And so, um, you know, trauma brings that on, no matter what kind of trauma it could be. For me, it was going through the, the divorce for Someone else, it could be losing a loved one. Some, you know, it could be bullying. It could be anything in life that just triggers 
that, you know, those emotions within the person that they feel as though, you know, life doesn't mean anything anymore and that it's better to be gone or to die than to live in the pain. And so, um, you know, I, I was able to mask a lot of my depression. I was able to mask a lot of my pain and a lot of my hurt that, um, you know, I could go to work and nobody would even know that I would I was battling, you know, the, the you know, the spirit of suicide. Nobody even knew. And so and you know, you mentioned about, you know, you know, we 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 know about it but we don't talk about it and, you know, it's silent and it's because some people, you know, don't recognize it and then if if, if people recognize it they don't know what to do, they don't know how to deal with it and so therefore it doesn't get treated. And so, um you know, I was really grateful that the Lord had his hand upon my life that I did not, you know, end my life because of the great things he's doing, you know, has done since then. But, um, yes. you know, just dealing with just the, the traumatic change of life that your your body, you know, we're not built. God didn't create us to 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 be able to sustain the all the traumatic um, things that happen to us. It's it's just so many, you know, whether it's your finances, your health, other people, your you know, your losses. It could be your self esteem, it could be, you know, your fat and you want to be thin. It, it it could be, you know, your 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 dark skin and you want to be light skin. I mean just so many things about us that we may or may not accept and then you have outside influences trying to, you know, uh, weigh in on those things. And then, um, you know, for me, being married for 23 years and going through a divorce, that was very traumatic for me because I, I didn't have a plan B for my life. That was my plan A. I didn't have any other mm. options for myself. I wanted to be married, you know, and then when divorce came in, I had to learn how to accept it, and I had to learn how to change my life and, tra- and and go through this transition alone. And when I say alone, I had family and friends around me, but I didn't have a mate anymore. You know, that foundation was, was cracked. That foundation was removed from me. And so my, my emotionally, you know, my mind uh, and my body was going in a totally different direction. And so, um, you know, the depression, of course, settles in, and, um, you know, it started to affect me physically whereby I was getting migraine headaches every day. I'd wake up with a migraine. I went bit. I went to sleep with a migraine. You know, pills wouldn't do it. And so, you know, I, I, I walked through it. You know, I'm really grateful, you know, for the Lord. I walked through it, and he, you know, helped me through that whole, you know, um, transition in my life but you know you know it's, it's like you said we um it, it's it's prevalent it's more so now um than ever before and, and and you know that was back in 2008 when I was going through it and you know it's just really sad that we don't want to deal you know communities don't want to deal with it and just kind of brush it under but it's, it's a it's a, a sickness that really has to be dealt with and it can be dealt with and it can be cured Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Wow, I, I really, I really thank you for what you shared. Then now we go into your book. Uh, I want to touch on it just briefly before we start talking about your latest book. But had you completed your transition from the end of a relationship to feeling whole again when you sat down? And this is amazing. From that was then to this is now too. Your book completely whole. And do yeah. you think that transition is what inspired you to write completely whole? Yeah, it really was. Um, I felt that, um, you know, that was then, this is now, was my breaking point. And so coming out of that and really being whole again enabled me to write the book completely whole. And I think after you've been broken and scarred and battered, you can't stay that way. You you shouldn't want to stay that way. There should be some some resolution to all the pain that you've gone through. And for me, coming out of that and, and writing completely whole, that book deals with, um, you know, the whole man, spirit, soul, and body. Because you know, God doesn't want us to be broken and cracked in any area of our lives. You right. know, we're, we're all a process. We're all, you know, a, a product of being fixed. 
And so, um, you know, and we're all a work in progress, definitely. And so writing completely whole, I deal with um, every aspect, or I try to at least deal with most of the aspects that we we deal with daily, you know, um, you know, being whole in our spirit, you know, spiritually, emotionally, uh, being whole in our minds, and then, you know, um, you know, just, walking in wholeness in whatever area that can be. And and for me, it was really emotional wholeness because I had to realize that uh, once I once I accepted uh, where I was in my life and the transition that I was in, that allowed God to really bring healing to me. You know, a lot of times we don't want to accept where we are and therefore we can't become whole because we were in denial, we're in rejection. And so once I realized that, you know what, this was my life and this is how things were going to be, um, God began to, you know, bring health and, and healing and wholeness to me. And so completely whole really does bring a person to an awareness of where they are and how they can be fixed, whether it's their finances, whether it's physical condition, whether it's, it's emotional, uh, whatever, you know, your, your the lack is. God brings complete wholeness into those areas of our lives. Yes, yes. Oh, what a story. What a story. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that was then. This is now to completely whole. And then you go into your novel writing. So can you tell us what happens? Uh, do, we're working our way up off the shelf, listeners, to um, Paulette's new book. So you can get a little tease of some of her previous books where we talk about her latest book. But what happens during the weekend trip? That Candace and Kaylin that they take that that changes <laughs> their lives. Oh my goodness, uh, living separate lives. Um, what changes that weekend is that those five, four uh, high school uh, girlfriends. Well, of course they're in their you know they're in their thirties now, so you know years have gone by since they really have been you know communicating with one another. And so um, that weekend brings a lot of, of of anger. It brings in a lot of bitterness. That uh, weekend brings in a lot of revelation. Um, it's one of those weekends that you go, hmm, I didn't know you like I thought I did. You know? And, yeah, and so um, they they – those four uh, friends, they live totally different lives. They have, you know, spiritually they're all different. They're at different levels in their faith. They're at different financial levels, emotional levels. You know, you know they 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 live. You know, one lives in Napa, one lives in you know in in the in downtown Oakland. So they have so they're so different now, and that's what happens with us in relationships. You know, when we go up, when we, um, you know. We grow up with with our best friends, and you know, ten, fifteen years, it you know, um, separates us, and then we get together and we realize, man, life has changed us, you know. And then, as they communicate with one another, they're you know bringing each other up to date as to you know where they've been in life, and um, you know, for for one of them, um, relationships um, they change, and so you know that weekend brings. Um, their lives totally in full circle, and they realized mm-hmm. that they didn't know one another as well as they thought. And now, wow. because the situation has happened, they all are affected by this one decision that one of the girls made. And it's a it's a story on, on um, forgiveness. It's a story on um, you know relationships. It's a story about because every one of them, are, they're going through something in life. And, it's I mean, we can identify it because, you know, you can put a, a, a group of ladies together and everybody's story is different and everybody is going through something. And it's how, how you, you know, you really um, deal with the situations at hand. But that we can change all of them. It really did. So uh, living separate lives, it's, it's really about, you know, the lives that each one of them lives and how, um, you know, um, their lives have, have really just kind of went in totally different directions and a decision changed all their lives forever. Wow. <laughs> living separate lives, living separate lives. And it's, I know it has to do with, like, Jordan and, 
and some of the uh, uh, Candace and some of the, the, like you say, some of the marriages and what happens, like yeah, with Jordan and yeah. Eric, and and uh, when the, when somebody is blindsided, for example, yeah. when Eric asked uh, Jordan for a divorce and she's shot. You know what? You generally, we talking about uh, Paula Hopper's book, Living Separate Lives. Generally. Yeah, they say it's the husband who's blindsided. That when a woman asks for a divorce, the, the man, they when they do surveys and they ask who's the happiest married, the guys always come out happier. And it might be because I think women work so hard at keeping a family together and strong, and women mm-hmm. work so hard at keeping a man. And it seems like men just enjoy the fringe benefits of it without putting in <laughs> as much work. And that might be why women, when they survey women, they don't come out, they don't respond that they're as happy as men. So when a woman files for divorce, the guy is shocked. But in Living Separate Lives, you've had Jordan be the one that's shocked when Eric asked her for a divorce. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and um, you know, and I can really attest to that because that's how my relationship with my husband acts for a divorce, <laughs> you know. Um, and so I think you know what, um, you know, you you mentioned how women, you know, we, you know, for me, I'll just put my name out there. You know, you I, you don't want it, you know, for women. I didn't want it, and so and yeah. she, of course she didn't want it, but he did, and and. Sometimes what we do is, you know, we we we're so dissatisfied with our with our relationship. We we look at all the negative stuff and not all the positive stuff. And so when we when we look at all the negative stuff, sometimes that you know that outnumbers the positive stuff. But it's the it's those negative stuff that can be worked on, you know. And you have to have two people that are willing to work on a relationship in order for it to work. And so um, you mentioned about being blindsided, and a lot of times we are blindsided because one of the, you know, individuals in the relationship thinks that all is well, while the other one is contemplating, I want to leave. <laughs> and so you are blindsided when the other person says, I want a divorce. You have no clue that that was even coming, you know, yeah. no signs that it was even coming. And and that's the real uh, challenge of, of being in a, you know, in, in, in a marriage or in a relationship, period, because even though you may have the best of communication, nobody's going to communicate to you at that, you know, other than the time they're ready to leave that, hey, I want out of this relationship, you know, so, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so you, that's something living separate lives that uh, for our listeners, Paulette has firsthand experience that you can add a lot of authenticity to what happened yeah. in the story, even yeah. even though it's fictional. Now, after living separate lives, you wrote a children's book. So you, your first two books were nonfiction. Then you Correct. wrote separate lives, which is a novel, and then you you then you journeyed into writing a children's novel, which is Princess Nevia Nevia. Correct. Nevia Nevia. What inspired you, Paulette? to veer off into writing a children's book. <laughs> well, Nevaeh is actually my oldest daughter, my oldest granddaughter's name. And ah. she, yeah, so she asked me, she calls me, I'm, I'm called Mimi. So she asked me to write a book with her name in it. And I did. And so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, she, she asked me to write write a book and so a couple of days goes by, and she says, Mimi, are you done with my book? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, Mimi, not done with your book yet, but Mimi is going to get done with your book really soon. And so that really uh, inspired me to write a book. You know, it, a, a tremendous blessing for your children and your grandkids to, you know, see what you do. And then they ask you, can you write something with my name in it? And so I was so happy to be able to do it. Uh, Princess Nevea, Lessons on Self-Discovery, um, she is actually wanting to be a princess. And so what Mimi does is she brings out some very good qualities uh, within the little daughter, within the, her little granddaughter that she already possesses of being a princess. She just doesn't know she's one. And so as the, you know, the story and the dialogue goes between uh, Nevaeh and her Mimi, she realizes that, um, you know, she's been 
a princess. She's she's beautiful, but she may have not been told she's been beautiful, you know. And there's qualities about um, this little girl that Mimi brings out. Um, it's a it's a, a book on teaching about bullying. It's a book on teaching about respect. It's a book on teaching about self-esteem. It's a book about teaching on uh, being obedient to your parents and, you know, obeying your teachers. And, and so it's a lesson. It's, it's lessons in that book that her Mimi teaches her, but it's also lessons that we can teach our own little girls, our own little grandkids, our own little nieces, you know. And, and even though it's a book for, you know, little girls, I mean, you can change it to to fit a little boy, you know. And so um, so that's really where that book came from. My oldest uh, granddaughter's name is Nadea. Oh, oh, that's that's sweet. So she <laughs> she write a book, and so you wrote one. Do you think you will write any more children's books now that you've written one? I've heard some authors say that writing children's books, you assume it's easy, but that it's it's difficult because you you you, you have a very limited amount of words to work with to tell the story. And children, if we think adults' attention is fleeting. A child's might even be more so, but do you think after having written this book that you'll write any more children's books? Oh, sure, sure. You know, I I, I, I thought that it was, um, for me, it was great writing it because, it, you know, your, dia- your dialogue is not long. And so, um, you know, my... my I, my book is probably less than, you know, 20 pages. And so, I, you know, I think you can, um, you know, share a story and get your point across, especially keeping in mind that the attention span for a child is, you know, very, very limited. So, yeah, I definitely will be writing more children's books. Good, good, for, good for you. Good, good for you. I love children's books. Even as an adult, I still like it. <laughs> now we're going to get to uh, your new book, Secrets Revealed. Uh, is that based on real life events? Um, Secret Places Revealed is a um, a fiction, a Christian fiction, and is it based on real life events? You know, the um, it's a love story, and not necessarily real life events. Um, I wanted to, I love reading romance stories, and so I wanted to write my own love story, you know, and so I was able to do that. I had, when I was writing, actually, when I was writing my nonfiction work, um, the the passion, the nudge came to write a fiction book, and so being able to pan secret places revealed has been a dream for me, and to see it you know, being sold and, and it come alive has been a, a dream come true, has been an answer to prayer. And um, being that it's a love story, I wanted to, um, you know, create these characters, of course, who have their own problems with romance, who have their own problems with relationships, who have their own problems with life, period. But they find a way, um, fate brings them together, and they find a way to have a relationship that still has issues that they learn to work through and they learn to fall in love with one another. And so um, I loved writing the story. I love developing these characters, and I really love the fact that I was able to write something that I'd want to read myself. I'd want to be in the characters myself. I'd want to dialogue with these characters myself. And so um, and to, to read it myself, to write it, and then to see it uh, being sold has just been a, a tremendous blessing for me. Yeah, now, who is Aaron Blackman? Can you tell us about Aaron Blackman? <laughs> Oh, I'd love to tell you about Aaron. (laughs) You're not going to believe this story, but Aaron Blackman, um, oh, my God, Aaron Blackman is a a real estate developer, 
story takes place in the Oakland Bay area. So it's um, for those who are in the, um, my immediate area, they can identify what a lot of the 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 scenery that the book talks about. But Aaron Blackman, he is a um, a very handsome uh, African American male who um, has been hurt from a previous relationship. He has everything in life. He has his own real estate development business. So, you know, money, fame, and, you know, a home and and all of that, he got it going on. But it's just that one area in his life and his relationship that he's like, don't want to deal with it, put it on hold, you know. And so um, with Aaron, um, he's not looking for love. He don't want to be in love. He's comfortable right where he is doing his business. He just wants to focus in on that. And then, you know, Simone drops in on him. And so um, <laughs> developing, you know, developing uh, Aaron, the greatest blessing or one of the blessings that I, I've had to, to write him is that I, I've been able to actually, um, the character that's on the cover of the book, I've been able to meet him on Facebook, and his name is A.C. Brown. And so that, yeah, that itself was like, ah, what? Wow. You know, yeah, when my graphic designer showed me the cover, um, I didn't know him at the time. And um, he had gotten a you know, the cover, somebody had sent him the cover when they, they recognized who he was. And one day on Facebook, um, he had posted the cover, and his family and friends were all commenting him on, on, the co- on him being on the cover of face, on you know, on the cover of the book, and, and someone tagged me. We have a mutual friend, and they tagged me, and they introduced me, and they said, did you know that this was A.C. Brown? And I'm like, no, I don't know A.C. And so I, you know, went to his page, and I started reading the comments, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's my book. (laughs) You know, that's my book cover. And I introduced myself. Yeah, you know, I introduced myself. I said, hey, I'm the author of uh, the book, and he introduced himself. He said, hey, I'm A.C. Brown. I'm the uh, the male on the, the, you know, the cover of your book. Wow. uh, Yeah, so it has been real fun actually um, being able to develop Aaron the character because now uh, I have someone that I could, you know, converse with and I could talk about, help me develop this character, and that's really what he did. You know, I was able to, um, you know, to ask him questions about his likes and his dislikes, you know, some of his perks, some of his, you know, pet peeves some of his, you know, what he would do in this situation. And so I had a a conversation. I would have conversations with AC, and I developed, you know, um, the character of Aaron really behind someone who um, I got to know very well. And so um, a lot of, you know, Aaron's character has been derived from actually the, the, the character on my, on my, on my cover of my book. So it's it's been fabulous. It's it's been a great journey for me to be able to write him, and so people can, um, you know, as they read about Aaron and those that know AC, you know, they say, oh yeah, that's him. Oh yeah, that's him. You know. <laughs> so, uh, why? Now, yeah. Can you tell us again? He gave up on relationships. What happened? Did he have a hard breakup? What, did he just decide he's going to go after his business and he he can get to relationships later? Well, actually, what had happened to him, he had been in a relationship, and so um, it it didn't, um, of course, it ended very badly in the relationship. He had, um, was in a relationship with someone at his job, and so... Wow. Um, they say don't ever because, do that. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, because the relationship ended so badly, um, the um, his, the ex girlfriend, her name is Macy. She didn't, you know, walk out of his life just so willingly. Of course, she's, you know, she's crushed and and you know she's, you know, very um, bitter, and um, and so she makes it very difficult for him. And so he does, and what he has vowed is to never get into a relationship again with someone that he works with. Yeah, I'm telling you, I told him don't do it. Yeah, and so that that really has, you know, he's put a halt to that. But 
he had to learn to change that because Simone walks in and she's one who has now worked, works in his office. So now he has these feelings that he has to deal with. So he has this struggle going on with what he knows he should not be doing, but his heart is telling him to do it. Wow. Oh, my God. You know, this is the thing that makes uh, story novels, and it can help people in their own real lives. But so fascinating that you, to see the characters in conflict. I'm telling you, they've said over and over, he's working human resources, do not. Do not enter relationships. At work, they can seem so perfect. You swear you're in love, but when they end, they end very, very badly. So they tell yeah. people don't do it. But there's some people who have met their their spouse on the job. Well, Michelle and Barack Obama, and it's worked. It, there's yeah. some that it, it has worked. And then, of course, when it ends, you got to see the person every day. That's a little tough. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> what's... What's going on with Simone Heron at the start of the novel? What's going on? We know she works there where Aaron is. Is she is she a new hire? What's going on yeah. with her when the book first opens? Well, what's going on with Simone is she's in uh, she's in New York and then she's been in New York for pretty much uh, most of her life. Well, most of her life she's been in New York, and so um, she was um, engaged to be married. And her fiance dies, and so um, actually he he was um, he was killed a few months before they were uh, going to be married. And so Simone is at a place of being broken. She's at a place of um, needing a change in her life, you know. And um, and sometimes I know in real life, sometimes all we need is just a change of environment, a change of atmosphere can just do wonders for a person. And that's really where she is. And so the book opens up and it talks about um, how she got to be where she is and how her emotions have just really, um, you know, um, have, have just taken the forefront of, of, of where she is and how she's going to deal with, with what is going on. And so, um, it opens up and it talks about Joshua and it talks about her decision to leave New York. And so everything about New York uh, reminds her of him. That's where she met him. They went to school there. They, um, um, I mean, he was her soulmate to her. And so being that he has been removed from her life, now she's, you know, facing what do I do you know, do I stay in New York? Do I leave? And so that's where the story picks up, where she decides that she's going to come back to uh, the Bay Area. And the Bay Area is where her family is. Her mom is still alive. Um, she has a sister and a brother. And, um, you know, they have always wanted her to come back to the Bay Area after Joshua left. But, of course, she has to make that decision up for herself. And so, she comes back to the Bay Area and, um, you know, things work out where she's able to, um, you know, she's a paralegal and she's able to work for him. Now, Simone doesn't necessarily need to work. She is very, you know, financially set. Um, she works because it takes the place of just being idle. Working for her takes the place of having to think about you know, Joshua, having to think about her losses, having to think about, you know, where her life could have been. You know, um, there's a scene in the book where she, you know, um, talks about the kids that her and Joshua could have had, what they looked like her, what they looked like him, what they have her brown eyes, what they have his curly hair, what they, you know, have his, his nose, his, his smile. And so she's going through all these emotional changes thinking about what could have been. So the move for her and working for her takes her mind off of that. And so um, she's able to meet Aaron. And um, and that's where all the the internal fireworks start to set off. And mind you, they they have they fought being in this relationship with one another. He has his issues about relationship, and she, you know, she's still dealing with Joshua. And even though it's been, you know, you know, a couple of years, she's still dealing with the fact that she's without this this you know man that she had 
you know, grown to love and was going to spend her the rest of her life with. And so um, the, the attraction is there between the two. And, um, you know, I think for him, um, he couldn't really understand how this woman could just drop into his life and his emotions just kind of got, got all over the place, you know. <laughs> and so he said wow. he to grips with that. And yeah. so he deals with... Um, you know, his decisions on, you know, not being involved with anybody in his on his job. So he's he contemplates that, he deals with that, he knows he shouldn't, but yet this woman has just, you know, really sparked something within him, you know. And so she's you know, she's a she's a totally different than the one he had before. And so, um and then plus he has his own um Deal. He has his relationship is just that his problem. He has other issues that he has to deal with, you know. And and I don't want to you know share the, the what yeah, he but, has. To but do. he's a, you say yeah. he's a successful man. Does he have siblings? Does he have siblings? She's from New York. What is the where does the story take place? Does he have siblings? And are all his siblings very successful? Yeah, actually, he has a brother named Sean, and they actually have the business together. And so they're both they both are real estate developers, and so it's centered in in Oakland. And so um, um, their mother is still alive, and so him and his brother, the di- um, um, a lot of the dialogue that's going on in the story is between him and his brother Sean, and then. Um, Simone has a best friend named Kendra who's still in New York, but they have, you know, a very good um, close relationship still, even though she has, you know, she has moved to California. Um, And so Sean is one of those brothers that, you know, he keeps it 100. He keeps it, he keeps Aaron in check about all things. And Kendra does the same thing with Simone. So they have two people uh, in their lives that they, you know, can talk to, they can converse with, they can bounce ideas off, but who also keeps it 100% of our relationship. Okay, okay. Um I have to ask you this next because I'm trying to picture them both in my mind. Uh, so, so we see Aaron is from a family, an up and coming family. He, he and his brother, they're both let's go get it, not sit back and just dream about it and wait for it to fall in their lap. And Simone, just trying to give the off the shelf listeners a little bit more about her before I ask you the next question. So, does she have siblings? And are her? Is, some see some characters like some people that everybody in the family is not doing well, and except for this one person, uh, Aaron and his brother both are doing well. What about Simone? Does she have siblings? And what's her family like? Yeah, Simone actually has um, a sister uh, named Tori, and Tori is a work in progress. She is okay. one of those. She's one of those sisters who um, depends on. Well, she has a job. She does work, but her problem is spending money. And so she's one of those kind of sisters where her priorities is totally off. It's not, uh, you know, take care of my, 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 you know, my home. She stays with her mom still. And so she is a spender. And so when she um, gets in financial troubles, she always looks to her sister and her brother to bail her out. And so uh, she's one of those sisters who will take advantage of the situation just because she knows she can. And so um, there is, and and Tori is an adopted child, and so her relationship with Simone and their brother uh, Devin, Devin actually is a very successful um, dentist. And so he's single as well. And so uh, Tori has two successful people in her home, that she can look up to, but yet she's totally opposite to them. And so they have this family conflict that always erupts when they all get together. And so um, their mother um, always, um, when it comes to, you know, dinner and and family, they all sat down together at the table. That was something um, that they never um, strayed away from. They always had dinner together. 
Um, they always had that family unit, but they were, there was always still something within the sisters and the brothers that always was need, something always needed to be worked on. And a lot of times it was Tori and the and her personality and the way she was that really um, uh, uh, brought a lot of contention within the relationship. And so they're both from different types of families we see. So for our listeners, they can see a difference there. Before I move on, how old is Aaron and how old is Simone? Something's telling me in my mind that she's a lot younger than he is. Well, actually, they they are um, kind of around the same age. They are in their okay. 30s. Yeah, they're they are in their um in their thirties and um and of course you know Devin is a couple of her um Simone's brothers a couple of years older than her, and then um, Tori is younger. Um, Aaron and Sean are a couple of years uh, apart, so they all are you know kind of in the same age range. But every last one of them, of course. Um, they all live, you know, their their lives are so different. They're, you know, they come from different families, as you mentioned. And um, and so I try to cover um, the different types of families, of course, that we can really identify with. You have uh, Sean and, and, and Aaron that come from, um, a, a, you know, a, a single mom as well, but yet they are very successful men, you know, and, you know, men that, they have their own, you know, problems in life, just like all of us. And then you have Simone and and her family, who basically, if we looked at them, we would probably think, man, they got some dis- dysfunctional in that family, you know, Tory. <laughs> and so uh, you have, you know, two different families um, being portrayed in the book. And and I know that as readers, as they read it, they can say, oh, man, I have a Tory in my family, and I got a Sean in my family. You know, and so it's readable. <laughs> it's not only readable, but, it's, you know, you can identify it. You can identify okay. with the story. Now, what have readers been saying about Secret Places Revealed so far? Um, the reviews have been great. Um, people have said they loved it. Um, they're sharing it with other um, their other friends. Um, one reader said it should be a movie, um, and so people are loving the story. Um, they're loving the twist in it. They the characters are believable. The story is believable. And if you are a romance reader, if you like inspiration, you would really love living separate lives. And so I'm, I'm talking about I'm, uh, uh, Secret Places Revealed. You would really love uh, <laughs> Secret Places Revealed, getting my books all mixed up here. Uh, you love the story. And so people are really um, enjoying the read. Um, people are, um, you know, emailing me, texting me, and telling me, you know, their take on it. And so I have about 33 reviews, and they're all really great reviews, four and five stars. So I'm really glad about that. Um, and so it's a it's a really great book to add to your library and to read it. And uh, I, I, you know, tell readers, you know, uh, one-click read and post a review. Okay, okay. So I want to ask you, do you see this book becoming a series? And then I want to ask you a few quick marketing questions. Do you see, because sure. we only have about seven minutes left, but do you see Secret Places Revealed? You haven't written a series book yet. Do you see this book becoming a series book? Well, you know what? Readers are like, uh, is Sean and Kendra going to get together? <laughs> you know, so, you know what, uh, Denise, I don't know. Um, it may or may not. I think that if it does, of course, it's going to be, you know, with um, – I left the book off, not as in a cliffhanger, um, but I didn't leave it where they got married, where Simone and Aaron got married. So if I was to, you know, pick it up from that store, from that, um, then, of course, it would be a series. Um, but um, I'm not really sure yet. And um, so it's just kind of up in the air. Okay, okay, so it could maybe uh, listeners or it may not become a book series. Now I want to talk briefly about you do marketing, you not only your own books, but you also help other authors getting them radio interviews. Um, 
can you share three to four marketing tips that writers can use, not that you've read about, but that you've seen work? This is something I try when I ask people, whether I'm interviewing them on my blog, Write Money, Inc., or on radio for another magazine that I'm writing for. Don't tell me what you read. I want to know what you have seen work for you. You've seen your book sales go from maybe 10 to 200 after you did something. Can you share three to four marketing tips that you've seen work that writers can use to introduce their books to more readers and increase their book sales? Well, um, I am a um, promoter of online book exposure. And so what I can share with um, aspiring, you know, authors is to make sure that you get your book out there um, to an audience of readers by way of bloggers, by way of doing radio shows, by doing guest posts, by doing online interviews. Um, it's it's searching for um, places where you can, you know, promote your book. Um, the greatest, because the Internet is so wonderful when it comes to, um, you know, marketing and promoting yourself, um, guest blogging is fabulous. For me, I've been on a lot of guest posts. I've done a lot of guest posts. I've been on a lot of blog um, spots, um, sharing my book. I've been on my own virtual book tour that I've done. Um, and so um, that's one thing that authors really should implement is doing a virtual book tour, is being on different, you know, blogs to, you know, talk about your book and put excerpts about your book, put your trailer on there, put your, you know, your website links and all those things on the on different blogs. And so for me, that works. Um, I know when my book um, first came out, um, and a, and a, a couple of you know a few of my other clients can attest to this as well. Um, when they you know the book first comes out, and because they're on these you know the blogs, they get massive exposure, and so they get that bump. You know um, on Amazon, you know they become they you know can become bestsellers if that's your aspiration to do that. It's possible to do that, you know, and so that's one that's one tip. And uh, another tip is to be consistent. You can't just, you know, start out marketing and promoting and then, you know, you know, a month or two, you just don't do it anymore. You have to be consistent. I still promote my first book, you know, and my book is over eight years yes, old. Yes, and, you yes. know, and so you have to you have to be consistent. You have to bring your book in the presence of, of readers all the time. And so I try to do that. You know, and so I know other people may think, man, I always see her book, or man, she never gives up. No, I don't. <laughs> I need readers, you know, and I need my books in front of people. <laughs> you know what's interesting? I read I read a blog uh, by a, a, a an author who is self-published, and years ago she was a bestseller, and she said uh, one of the reasons that she said have do you notice that after a couple of maybe a year or a couple of months after your book's released, the sales drop off? She said, "You know why that is? When you first your book was first launched, you were on fire telling everybody about your book. You were on fire online and offline, going to book events and putting out flyers and doing email and uh, direct mail through the. Post. You were doing all kinds of stuff, and now you've waned down." And yeah. now your book sales have dropped off. And you know what I said? She hit the nail. The, she hit the nail right on the head. You you gotta say, look, we hear that in in scriptures, uh, uh, Paulette. You gotta you can't. It ain't it ain't cooling off season. You gotta keep going right. like you just started. Yeah, yeah, you, you really have to, do. You have to keep it? going like you just started. Yeah, yeah, and you and you always have to, you know, consistency is the key. And then you always have to try to think of other ways you can market yourself, you know. Um, I'm always looking for places to, you know, uh, to advertise, whether it's free or not. You know, I, so I look at both angles. I do free stuff and I do paid advertisement. And so – you know, you have to look for places where you can get the exposure. And so, and that's what I do. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. And when I'm on, um, when I'm on Facebook, I find opportunities. But I've, I've also found some great opportunities on Twitter. 
And so yes. when I'm on there, I'm looking for places where, you know, other people have, you know, been on an interview and stuff. And so I found places where I could, you know, post my book and, and do an interview. And, and I found some great places that are free that will post my book, you know, people that will offer to help any authors um, advertise their book on their own blog. And those bloggers, you know, they get thousands and thousands of hits a day. And so just the exposure alone, you know, can lead yes. to a sale. An exposure alone can lead to me being on somebody's somebody else's blog. The exposure alone can lead, to, lead me to being on somebody's uh, show. And so, you know, you have to, as an author, you have to think outside the box, and you just cannot stop, you know, promoting and, and, and making yourself available and, and being that the, the Internet is so open. And so it's just a matter of us being diligent. It's a matter of us doing the work because it has to be done because nobody's going to do it for us. And so we really no. do have to be very consistent out there. I appreciate you sharing that, Paulette, and appreciate everything you shared about each of your books, including uh, uh, your la- your latest new book, Secret Places Revealed, and some other books that Paulette Harper has written are completely whole. That was then. This is now. Living separate lives. Princess Nevia. 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 Right now, author's manual and her latest book, which we encourage you to go out and get a copy of, which she discussed here today on Off the Shelf. If you come in late to the show, and we know we get a lot of listeners through the archives. You you can go back and, and, and listen to the show in its entirety after it finishes streaming. But her new book is titled Secret Places Revealed. I encourage you to visit Paulette Hopper online at paulettehopper.com, P-A-U-L-E-T-T-E-H-A-R-P-E-R.com, paulettehopper.com. We want to thank Paulette for being here with us, and we want to thank e- each and every last one of you, our off-the-shelf listeners. Please remember, bookmark. A little switch up this week, Monday at 7 p.m., Monday, November 14th, we will have a show, and then we will also have a show next Saturday, but right now I'm focusing on mon- this Monday at 7 p.m. So please come back and tell your family and friends everywhere to tune in to Off the Shelf. Now, our normal times are Saturdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I encourage people there. We have had guests who've gone on to national and international success and, and not just in writing, but in, in media. Some are, are on television, have their own television shows, uh, and they're doing extremely well. You will you will miss these people if you don't listen to Off the Shelf. So I'm encouraging you to bookmark it, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or New York City Time, Saturdays uh, Off the Shelf. As I always tell you, you are inc- you are incredible. We have to start to really believe the truth about ourselves. You're incredible. You are amazing. You're awesome. Go out and create a fabulous day for yourself. Love yourself and create a fabulous day for yourself. Thank you so much, Paulette. I'll shoot you an email. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. <laughs>